I see all these people flipping out about these cartoon apes. And I'm like, what? What are these apes? Like, what is going on? One of the best things that NFTs have brought to the table is they have made collecting so accessible to people. All my early collectors are OGs in my mind. But for me, art is like a need. It's not a want. And collecting is just another form of that. I clicked really fast on the people drop and I actually managed to get it for $1. If I've collected your work, I'm holding it with diamond hands. If you're collecting something, it could be become hot in two minutes or 200 years. Welcome to the Collector's Call with Particle, where we chat about art with the top collectors and creators in Web3. I'm your host, Scooter, and today our guest is Brian Brinkman, an artist and animator. His work has been exhibited internationally, auctioned at Sotheby's and Christie's, shown at film festivals, and featured in publications. He is an advisor for numerous Web3 projects, and he also co-hosts the Art First podcast with Adam Tastic. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Brian Brinkman. Brian, welcome to the Collector's Call. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful intro. And I'm, I got, I'm excited to go check out some of the works you mentioned. I knew about the Rift Cash one, but I didn't know about the, uh, the HR one. Yes, yeah, that's a, that's it's a brooding and, and very large physical sculpture that we were able to display at NFC Lisbon last year. So some folks got to see it in real life, which is probably how it should be experienced. But yeah, definitely, if you have a chance, there are a few of them. There are a few editions around the world. One at the HR Giger Museum as well in Switzerland, if anyone ever passes through. They also have a Giger bar there, which is like a recreation of an alien themed bar. It's on my to-do list, bucket list, I guess. It seems like a, a magical spot, but if you have a chance, by all means. That's awesome. Well, let's dive in. I have some intro questions for us, lots on art, and then lots on collecting as well. You've 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 said and, and experienced a lot in the collecting space, and so I hope we can take some time to meander through some questions along that line as well. To dive in, you've mentioned that some of your first jobs included diverse experiences like working as a, a corn detasseler, panini maker, and selling concession items at a dirt racetrack. What did you learn from those early work experiences and, and what exactly does a corn detasseler do? In the swell. Yeah, well, the, well the, thing, the thing about corn detasseling is in the Midwest, that's a job that the government allows you to work before you're 16 or 15. There's like a an age limit or a restriction on I mean, you have to, but because that it's considered like farm, farm kid work, like a 14 year old can go out into the fields and pull these tassels out, which allow the seeds to germinate and <laughs> make the corn. You know, there's, there's machines that do it, but those machines miss it. And so then they just send all these young kids through the fields in the morning and you rip out all these stocks. It's a, it's a horrible job. <laughs> I don't recommend it. What I learned from that is that every job after that is better because you have to get on a bus at like 4 a.m. and you know, you're just like getting cut up by like wet corn leaves. I mean, yeah, I would say, you know, you mentioned the panini one. I didn't really much from it other than like <laughs> how paninis are made. But I think, you know, all these type of jobs, whether it's concessions or waiting or all those early on helped me build up social skills in terms of being able to have a conversation with other people. You know, sometimes, especially being an artist, it's very kind of isolating. Any of those kind of retail jobs are really good at helping you kind of strike up conversations when you go to these like nft conventions like being able to like a uh, you know think of a topic to talk about when you run out of things to talk about that comes directly from being a waiter and like trying to have you know these these bite-sized moments with people that doesn't feel totally scripted or something exactly yeah that's it's an interesting observation it opens you up to the broader public and gets you used to interacting with people i think you mentioned as well some involvement in in a handful of roles where you've you've been exposed to some experimentation along the way, working at an instrument store, you you it sounded mm -hmm. like talked mm -hmm. your way into that role. I'm not sure if that was the intent, but just started helping out, and that that really feels aligned with with your experience in the Web three space, where you're willing to test and try out anything, whether or not it's going to result in in any formal employment isn't really the goal. More so, just to to be contributing to the space. Yeah, no, that's a good. Good research. Yeah, that was when I was in Philly in college. This guy I knew was like, hey, if you just come show up and start organizing the basement of this music instrument store, they'll probably start paying you. And so I just did that for a day or two. And I started like alphabetizing all their guitars and like they started cleaning up everything. And then they're like, okay, yeah, do you want to come work in the shipping department? And so then I did that for a summer. Uh, and I got to learn a lot about 
instruments and music production. And, you know, the problem with working at one of those places is that you want to buy everything. And so, like, you know, I, I built my own like audio recording closet while I was working there that I used to do the voiceover work for my animations. And so like, you know, it, in one way or another, it led to productive stuff in my life, but it was definitely a strange job. And, you know, the whole music instrument world is very funny. It's like, they have these like, people come in and they try to like, Oh, I want to test out this guitar. And really it's just an excuse for them to like do a bunch of riffs and stuff and like try and show off. And so they always had this uh, switch in the back that uh, they would flip if someone was like noodling too hard and they'd be like, Oh, actually it looks like we had a little power surge. You have to go. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. I didn't know there was a, a like a, a kill switch back there. to <laughs> Shut everything yeah. down. If anyone gets out of line. On, on the topic of uh, music, I've heard that you come from a, a family of musicians, but that wasn't really your path in life. What led you to you choose a, a different artistic path? And do you ever feel left out at family gatherings? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. The, a lot of my family goes and jams together. Yeah, my father's a drummer and my brother's a guitarist and singer and Everybody on my father's side are musicians. They grew up, you know, my grandfather was in a polka band and all of his kids grew up playing in the polka band and they all they became like rock, rock musicians and stuff. And so, you know, I didn't go down that path. I tried. I, I know remedial drums and guitar, but I'm not good enough to play in a band. But what I did find is that I, I tapped into that rhythm part of my brain. And I think um, whether it's animation or comedy, both of them are built on the idea of timing and rhythms and loops and, you know, kind of hitting these like rules of threes and stuff like that. And so even though I didn't manifest it in terms of writing music, I do think a lot of my artwork has that same kind of beat to it. No, oh, that's a good observation. Yeah, there is a bit of rhythm to the work that you're creating in a visual element, certainly. And then you do explore some some sounds as well, which I think we'll get into along the way. I have to ask about this. You're probably tired of sharing this story, but back in 2009, you received an unexpected boost in Twitter followers through what has come to be called the Brian Brinkman experiment. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, I mean, well, the backstory to that is I am a huge fan of going to live show tapings and, and, and any free thing. You know, when you're a poor artist living in New York, you go to any of these websites, it's like, what can I do for free? And a lot of that is going and being in the audience of things. And so, you know, I, one of those things I went to was the late night show with Jimmy Fallon. And, you know, I, I got my tickets to like the second week of that show. And then I got a call like that day because a buddy of mine worked there and he's like, hey, they're going to do this thing. Would you be interested in being like the the plant for this thing since you're coming to the show already and i was like uh sure well my to be honest my original thing was like no i don't i don't want to do that and they're like oh it'd be great for like getting your art out there and i was like i guess you're right i should like take this opportunity and so they kind of put me in the audience and then they had the, the dig guys kevin rose and alex and russell brand and all these people come on and they were like all right we're gonna do this thing where we tell everyone to follow a random person in the crowd and so they told everybody to follow me on twitter and at the time i had i think seven followers i wasn't really using twitter at all it was very early on like no one on twitter had a million followers yet it was like in, in those first few in the year or whatever and yeah it was like overnight i got like 10 thousand followers and then 20,000 followers and it was just it was, it was a whirlwind it was o overwhelming <laughs> and then for years I just lost followers because everyone's like why am I following this guy so it took me it took me it, it's kind of like it's kind of like a bull market chart where it goes really high and then it just drains for a, long, a couple of years and then you hit a bottom and then start to grow again so yeah, so that was that was a weird moment, and you know, to be honest, it it didn't lead to fame and fortune immediately, but some things did come from it. Like some, you know, show called the Life and Times. Tim reached out, and they're like, "Hey, your art, we saw it on your website, and it looks kind of like our show. Do you want to come out and work on the show?" And so I did that for a season, and so you know, it, it's it's interesting how like indirectly it led to things down the road. But I would say, you know. Of, of the people that follow me now on Twitter, there's only like a few dozen, I feel like, that are still around that remember that moment. <laughs> it's been a long time. Well, that's quite the story. You experienced the the highs and low of the attention cycle that we have here in, in crypto Twitter far earlier. So kudos to you for uh, for living and, and earning those scars at an earlier it, point. It forced me to get good at Twitter. And I think that has 
paid off, you know, a decade later where like I can, I don't know, I've, I've developed my voice on here. I think that's an important thing about Twitter is kind of figuring out your, your written voice. And so I'm glad I was able to get that kind of solved a long time ago. Great point. Great point. You began your artistic pursuits as an animator, creating short films like The Coffee Bird and A Fly Film. These are still lurking on, on YouTube. If anyone wants to track them down, they're really fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, they're embarrassing because they're like <laughs> almost 20 years old or something. It's it's always nice to be able to peer back into an artist's evolution. I think that's you, oh, you, you agree, see yeah. some themes that carry through and uh, and a lot of growth along the way. What what drew you to animation and how did your early experiences help shape your artistic trajectory? That's a good question. What drew me to animation? I mean, um, part of it is just growing up as a kid loving animation. At a certain point, I wanted to be a filmmaker. You know, well, yeah, I got I got really into kind of digital art in high school started making short films for Newgrounds. And I was like, oh, I actually like storytelling. Maybe I want to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be like Tim Burton. And then, you know, a buddy of mine was like, you know, Tim Burton was an animator. That's how he started. And if you learn animation, you learn everything that filmmakers make, but you also learn how to draw and storyboard and you, you become the full pipeline of storytelling. Oh, okay, cool. So that made me you know, go look into animation schools, which took me to Philadelphia where I got my degree in animation. But it was more of a experimental animation path where it's like you're making these short films. You're not like kind of learning to be inserted into like the Pixar pipeline or something. It's more of like, how do you create these short couple minute tales that you can submit to film festivals and stuff. So I think a lot of, you know, a lot of times when people think of animation, they're thinking of Rick and Morty or something, which is certainly a part of it but that wasn't the that wasn't the path that i necessarily saw myself going on i just wanted to get into storytelling mostly it's a, a good medium to to tell stories through and an interesting one with the take that you had on it your earliest uh, short films all seem to have a similar thread of absurdity within them in coffee bird for example a, a wounded bird and its caregiver are pictured at one point attending a viking expo together that particularly tickled me what was it about the absurd that made you want to explore that theme through your earlier works well you know there's this when it comes to animation it's easy to do comedy you know, everybody's expecting a laugh when it comes to animation. I think part of it's just from the Looney Tunes and all this other stuff. So with Coffee Bird, I wanted to kind of make an attempt at making a sad story. But I think adding that humor in only makes the sad part hit harder. And so like you mentioned, the Viking thing, that was that ties into the ending spoiler. The bird dies and they give it a cardboard box Viking funeral. So there was this kind of like, you know, how do you how do you explain that ending? in a way that doesn't come out of total left field, you know? And so, yeah, I don't know. I think that's, that's, a, that's the same thing I would say has always been the back and forth of my work is finding humor or fun aspects and then using that to talk about more deeper, serious topics at the same time. It's like, it's that spoonful of sugar stuff, you know? It's it's an effective way to lure people in, I think, to being able to have a, a deeper experience without even realizing it. And your art certainly achieves that. You you worked on both The Tonight Show and Saturday Night Live, for which you won four Emmy Awards for visual effects. How did those experiences help you to hone your skills as an artist and animator? Yeah, I mean, the those shows, especially The Tonight Show, that's five shows a week where you're getting there in the morning, there's a new day of news and you have a new list of things you have to create, whether it's visual effects, jokes of footage, or whether it's making monologue photoshops or making no bits and all that. And so every day you have to kind of go through this gauntlet of making the best thing you can given the time you have. And that makes you extremely well-rounded in terms of tool and technology and all that stuff. So yeah, you know, after some like 1500 episodes or something, you start to really get in the zone of like getting really fast at making stuff. And especially with SNL, it's like everything's done in one day there. And so you you have to learn to not get too precious with things. And it, in the end, it's about just does this serve the joke and make the laugh happen? And if that happens, then it doesn't matter as much if like, the visual effects, not a hundred percent realistic, you know? So there's a lot of that kind of 
allowing yourself to let things go to a degree. But yeah, those shows made me, they made me much better at After Effects and Cinema 4D in a way that I don't know many other places that would like force you to get good at so many different things so quickly. Not getting too precious with with work, I imagine, is a major boon to an artist. I suspect not creating visual art myself that it's hard to release something into the world. And so that that timeline probably aided in that. Well, it's much harder in now making my art that lives forever because, the you know, those type of shows, the episode airs. And then by the next day, nobody nobody cares, you know, because it's it's automatically dated material. With NFTs, everything we make lives forever, so I'm, I'm much more precious. And that was that was part of why I, I really enjoyed, you know, doing NFTs on the side for that first year I was doing NFTs because it allowed me to work on one piece for like a week versus a day. And to me, that felt like I could really overwork something and refine it and make it feel right versus having to kind of send it out the door right away. And I think you know that that just general feeling of you know how will this be perceived in the future plays probably gets into my own head more now than ever before (laughs) understandably so just before we turn to to nfts i have to ask about some other physicals you've created a lot of posters for a a wide range of events Uh, what's involved in creating a poster and how did this work contribute to your development as a an nft or digital artist yeah well i think part of I mean, one thing that's fun about being an artist is if you see something you like and you want to do, there's often a way for you to do it. Sometimes it doesn't pay. And for one of those is, you know, I'm a huge collector of screen prints of posters and concerts that I go to. I picked one up last week at Portugal. The Man, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's, a, it's something I appreciate because, you know, if you buy the t-shirts, they <laughs> they fall apart over time. And so there was a point where I was like, I want to make concert posters. How do I do that? And there was this thing called So Far Sounds. It was in different cities where people would go to these like random stores that were con- like converted for the night into a concert venue. And you'd go sit around and you'd watch music. And there was no talking allowed. Everyone just had to sit and enjoy the music for like an hour and a half. And I thought it was such a cool communal experience. And so I just reached out to them. I'm like, can I make, po- can I make you know, fly- posters or for your shows and they're like totally and so i did you know i did that for like a year or two and that was just me again finding an outlet for creativity without really having a plan to make there was no money to be made i could go see the concerts if i wanted which was fun but yeah there's a lot of times where it was i I, you know similar to like how people did his every days i would come up with a lot of just artistic challenges uh, you know I, I used to do a, a t-shirt a week and then i would sell that t-shirt and you know, do these kind of like you know just little personal challenges just to keep me creatively motivated outside of my day jobs i really like your your posters i think they're they're tasteful designs they're often aligned to a particular their product and so i think you're constrained in what you're designing but i i like when artists work within constraints folks can find them on gallery 1988 i think there are still a few copies available oh. there and oh, i yeah. i well those I are even different ones too those are well gallery 19 i should say that's a gallery i've worked with i worked with them for like five six years that's a pop culture gallery and so all the works they do there are based on movies and tv shows and video games and so it's like i i consider it high-end fan art but so the, the ones you're referring to there those are ar augmented posters that are i think there's one for the movie gattaca there's one for a mighty wind and there was one other one i'm spacing on right now oh donkey kong and so those were those were fun to do because they were you know shown in la and at the gallery so that's a that's a different type of poster. <laughs> like I said, I, I've I found a lot of different outlets for my creativity over the years. Yes, and and even augmented reality, which is pretty cool to see in those uh, animated physical works. Thanks. Well, let's turn to uh, to NFTs. Nimbuds, your collaboration with Manny Morales, is a collection of whimsical clouds released with art blocks. These are perhaps your most recognizable digital works having been featured by Sotheby's and Christie's and on SNL. What do you think accounts for the widespread appeal of this collection? And what have you done to to sustain the interest in these works over the years? That's a good question. I think there's something appealing in that the expressions allow the viewer to kind of give, put their own sense of feeling on the characters. I think when we set out to do it, we didn't, you know, 
it was an evolution of experimentation. And where we got to with it that I was most proud of was the ability to give a range of emotions with a simple set of lines and circles. And, you know, whether the it's looking outward or frowning and all this stuff, you get this sense of anger or happiness or contemplation or all this other stuff. I think there's something appealing about that because even though it's a very, very simple image, you get a emotion out of it. And that doesn't happen with a lot of art. And then I think, you know, where there's also this like interesting appeal of, you know, the technology on chain, the fact that it was a character based project that kind of preceded the the board eight meta that happened like four months later. I think, you know, at the time I saw it as a generative toy. You know, it was like a, a kid robot blind box toy. So if you click on it, it puts it back in the box. And I I I, I had a feeling collectibles were gonna happen, but I had I did not predict the rise of PFPs that would happen six months later. But I do think there's that that correlation there. And then how have I how have I kept up the the story of it? I in various ways. Uh, you know, a year after I did it, I, I made NIM buttons where I sent all the collectors buttons and hand drawn versions of them. Like two years later I did NIM teens where they grew up to be awkward teenagers getting their yearbook photos taken. And yeah, there's there's you know I've taken the NIMBUDs and seen, you know, help put them as traits in other projects, whether it's like Crypto Dick Butts has a NIMBUD background, you know, there's hats and various metaverses or PFPs that look like NIMBUDs. So it's kind of just taking them and building them into the the overall culture of the space too. You've been very effective in keeping that story going. I'm a big fan of the the NIM buttons. I like the images <laughs> of these and then the NIM teens as well. It, it, this was a very early project with with art blocks as well i think it was the 10th yep. one that was released with them so it's it, it feels like it's been with us and is fresh every day that i see one of these on the timeline and it's interesting when you reflect back that it's it's been here for quite a few years now so kudos to you for continuing to build and evolve that story and allowing it to stay top of mind with uh, everyone in this space yeah it's it's incredible how you know this was before ringers and adenzas and all that and so I was grateful to get to kind of ride that crazy wave that it went on and that brought so much more attention to it. Cause I mean, when they came out, they were, they sold out and they did well, but they weren't, you know, people, people that were in the know of our blocks enjoyed them, but it wasn't until maybe like, you know, well, surprisingly it was only a few months later, I feel like, or like half a year later that they, they put an art block Sotheby's sale together. I think they called it the Sotheby's set at the time, but that, that was like the real validator where I was like, oh, this is a part of something much bigger. And that then put a spotlight on everybody that was a part of those early drops, which was really cool. Definitely great to see all of the attention that they've they've garnered over the years. Some of your NFTs depict very distinct crypto themes like gas, cycle, and biorhythm. What interests you in exploring aspects of the crypto ecosystem through your art? Well, I think part of it is when I joined the space, I looked at, you know, the people that came before me and what they were creating, whether it was Coldy or Josie or a lot of money or Matt Cain, they were creating crypto art, quote, unquote, which was art that reflected on the technology in the space. And I think that's extremely important, especially early on. And so, you know, my art, I, I tried to combine that idea of talking about the the crypto art space with also talking about my own journey in the space. And so a lot of my work is kind of a combination of both, but I often think of it as like a diary of myself. And sometimes that diary is how I'm feeling. And sometimes it's what I'm learning and what sometimes it's like what I'm perceiving. And, and so, you know, a piece like you mentioned gas, like that was when like I'm thinking it came out around like October, 2020. And that was when Ethereum actually started to go up. And that was when gas started to go up. And I was like, oh, man, it's actually going to cost me like $50 to mint this on Super Rare. That's crazy. Uh, and so, you know, that piece is just a reflection of me learning, oh, this is how gas works. And that piece is like, you know, builds on this idea of like, you know, the space has the structures, these beams, and the structure of the space is built on gas. And, you know, there's we have to kind of respect that it's a part of the the infrastructure that we're building here. And so, you know, before that, I never really thought about it because gas was only like $3 to mint something. And then at a certain point, it was like 
back in 2021 or whatever, it got so high that like <laughs> things got real restricted. Now we're in a place where we have a lot of alternative chains that we can go mint cheap art on, which is amazing. But back back in 2020, there wasn't a lot of options in that sense. I think it's wonderful how you've managed to integrate your own personal storytelling and experiences into some of those crypto themes a pinned cycle here. And this is one that I think resonates with some folks of a certain era who played with a penguin version of, of this same game as children and, and seeing it reflected as <laughs> it sustains that whimsical element that you keep in all of your artwork, but also applies to life outside of crypto and beyond. Thanks. Yeah, the cycle one was fun. I think, you know, there's that that cycle chart that everyone shows that has like all the different names of the, the peaks and valleys and stuff. And so this is me trying to build my own version of that using that toy because I always just think about that toy. There, there's a few things I always think about with this space. There's that that toy and there's like the cycle we go through of going up and down. And then there's also this, I don't know, sometimes I feel like it's we're watching a horse race sometimes and we're just watching these charts battle each other and race against each other. But, you know, I think that's all that's all part of the fun of the space. It's fun to be a D gen as well. <laughs> Seeing a lot of people get a lot of token airdrops this week and I'm I'm excited for all of them. That's right. We have to take joy in others' success or we'll we'll brood about it. <laughs> yeah. There's always gonna be people making more money than you. That's the rule. <laughs> Precisely. Self assemblage is part of a series of of self reflective works that included Wired and Swing. Could you tell us about this work and what led you to create it? Yeah, so that that's a series that's much more you know, kind of self portraiture, and you know, I, I see it as this kind of journey of my, my diary as well. The the Swing or not Swing Wired that I did in twenty twenty that was about me feeling isolated by COVID and kind of living in this technology world and being kind of trapped. Half a year later, I did my nifty drop breezy where I take myself and I put myself on this cloud that's swinging, that's kind of become accepting of the space and where we're at and feeling good about it and seeing this kind of journey get easier. Going to swing, that was a piece that was about this feeling about collectors trying to control artists. And so if you look at it, it's it's kind of a marionette puppet, but the instead of being kind of like chained by the the wires i'm swinging on it and that was me basically saying like there's going to be a lot of collectors in the background that are trying to control artists but we can still enjoy the space and have a good time here even while that's all happening and so that was me just kind of saying like there's going to be these collectors that tell artists to do some certain ways there's going to be people that don't want to pay royalties there's going to be all this other stuff but we can still have fun here don't let it get you down and that, that was kind of that uh <laughs> that was me kind of pushing on this idea of control and who has control do we have the artists have control do our floors have control you know all this other stuff a bit of an you know a lot of my work is me having an identity crisis <laughs> and then with the self assemblage it's that was me kind of saying okay here's me you know almost 4 years into the space who am i what is my identity and to me that piece shows my identity is everything i've made like you mentioned nimbuts like our successes define us as artists. And so, you know, in that sense, my face in that piece is the art I've created. It is, you know, I, I threw in like 30 different pieces that I've made in the past into this big mass of moving parts that I'm kind of, it's like teetering in a way because I'm trying to balance all that. Every time you make new art in this space, you try to balance that into the bigger picture so that it doesn't all fall and collapse and everything, you know, you oversupply and all this other stuff. So it's, you know, as we, as we continue to create the weight of everything we make rests on our shoulders and we have to kind of accept that it's all part of us forever. Thanks for taking us behind the scenes to hear about it, if you're, a bit about your thoughts on, on those works. You have recorded the process of creating many of your early works through blogs that were posted uh, on Scent, and you continue to share behind the scenes details on on Twitter. Why is it important for you to document how your works are made? Yeah, I wish there was, a, you know, I miss Scent. I wish there was a, a a hub for us all to share more. I think there's there's two parts of it. One is educating other artists is a good way to share your knowledge and educating collectors is a good way for them to make informed decisions on what they're buying. I think the other there's a third aspect to it which is going through and looking back on your process as an artist helps you discuss it more like me answering that previous question 
that's because I went through those things after I was done and I said, okay, how did I get from A to B to C? And now I can take all that information and distill it into a thesis on this piece. You know, because a lot of the times when you're making art, you're kind of zigzagging and you don't really know what's driving you and you have to kind of take a moment to self-reflect and and kind of go back and look at it. So, you know, for me, there's that aspect. And I guess there's also the the bonus to it, which is you have this receipt of authenticity on how you made your work, which especially now with AI and other things, there's going to be more people questioning how you made it, if you made it. So the more you can go, hey, you know, I actually made this thing three years ago and here's how I did it, blah, blah, blah. That becomes a, a proof of work to, to steal that phrase. And so, yeah, I think it's always just, you know, it doesn't, there's no downside to sharing your, your, your secret sauce in that sense, because in the end, I don't know, it's like when comedians take their jokes and they put it on a special, they're like cementing it in as like, hey, here was my joke at the time and I own that joke now. And so, yeah, I just think it's, it's important. And when, as a collector myself, when I see an artist, I like their art, I immediately try to go find their website and look at their process and how they do it because I want to, I want insight, you know? Definitely. I, I really like seeing uh, works in progress released on the timeline, but I actually prefer looking back once I know what the, the finished product is and, and your threads on, on scent and the ones you share on, on X, Twitter are, are great. They, they only add more to the, the final product that you've created. Thanks, Thanks. for making those. Appreciate that. This week, you released a series of four works called Pioneers, which sold out quite quickly. This is part of the Moral Collective's Art Dubai show, Revolutionaries, which highlights the history of crypto art. How do these works help to celebrate the history of the crypto art movement? Yeah. Well, to me, when I approached this, you know, they, they reached out about doing this, this exhibition that kind of highlighted the history of crypto art. And so... It's good, kind of, you know, it's funny because now there's like books and all these things that have all come out at the same time that are all kind of saying this, the same thing. But, you know, I looked at like, what are the Mount Rushmore's of what we see in the space today? And it's like, you know, art blocks and all that, that's all tied back to autoglyphs. And, you know, PFPs is all tied back to punks and collectibles is all tied back to rare pepes and the art stuff is all tied back to quantum. So I was like, okay, well, I have these four Mount Rushmore heads. How do I show create pieces that kind of rebuild what they built but then insert my generative aspects into them in various ways and then also kind of define them as like silhouettes in a way and so it was it was kind of an interesting way of doing this kind of like paper cut out vibe to it and yeah it, it was fun to it was fun to create and yeah shout out to everyone that collected it and shout out to Morrow Collective and all the other artists dropping work this week it's worth checking out Morrow because there's so many amazing one of ones and editions by just incredible artists. It's an awesome show. Yes, lots of great work coming out through this. I really like how you've distilled some key totems within the the crypto art space uh, through your work. So kudos to you for for paving the way there. You're also curating a gallery show this weekend at Benzie Studio in Miami. What can you yeah. tell us about the show and your selection of artwork? Yeah. So yeah, if anybody's in the Miami area, I'm in the Miami area right now. It'll be in Wynwood and it's going to be starting this evening. It'll be, you know, so backstory is if you don't know who Benzie is, he's a, he's a really wonderful artist that creates work that often talks about time using clocks, often early 1900s punch clocks. And, you know, two art basils ago, I did a collaboration with him that we showed at Scope. And, you know, it was me and Jack Butcher and Jen Stark and Micah Johnson and Ron English. And it was a really wonderful thing where we all got to put our own takes on these clocks. And, I, you know, that was the first time I like spray painted clocks and or spray painted in general. And I made, I made this really colorful clock. And those pieces are now on display in this Winwood Gallery, and they all have digital screens built into it in addition to a bunch of other digital screens. And so he was like, hey, I have this gallery. I have all these screens. Do you want to do a show and utilize all this? And so I said, okay, cool. I don't really want to do a solo show, but uh, there's an opportunity for me to highlight a bunch of kind of local artists or artists that I've done drops with on Nifty Gateway as a publisher or art that I've collected recently and just kind of use it as an opportunity to give a boost to a bunch of other artists. So I, yeah, I curated this, this show of about I think it's like 16 or 17 works and I'm, I'm really excited to uh, 
Sure. I see some people in the audience, like Rebecca and Adam, who have work that'll be on display there. And yeah, no, it's going to be, it's going to be very fun. I think it's going to be very chill, <laughs> but I'm already having a great time in Miami seeing artists already. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, shout out to Rebecca and Adam and kudos to you on pulling this together. It looks like a great selection of artists and should be a lot of fun for anyone who's able to make it out. Let's yeah. turn to a few questions on collecting with our remaining time. Uh, outside of NFTs, you collect vinyl records, screen prints, and concert posters. In our increasingly digital age, what's the appeal in collecting physical works for you? Mm. Well, there's a decorative appeal. And I think with records, there's there's a dual appeal of like fandom and listen, you know, listening to records is just fun. <laughs> and I think there's what's the I'm just trying to think what's the appeal I don't know I think there's just an inherent like collecting bone in most of us and we everybody wants some sort of collection that represents their personality and so the art I collect is a extension of my personality and the music I collect is an extension of my personality and the more you collect it the more you can like build this general sense of who you are in terms of your taste maybe I'm getting too deep with this one but yeah, I don't know. I think it's just, it just starts when your kids and your, you know, when I was a kid, I was collecting X Men trading cards or you know video games or whatever. And it, yeah, that 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 I don't know what the word the drive <laughs> to catch them all <laughs> just continues as you get older. Yes, it certainly hasn't slowed down for any of us who've wandered into the Web three space. But it's nice to hear about some of those physical artifacts that catch your attention as well. You've shared a very succinct description of your approach to collecting digital art, asking, does it move and does it move me? How do those two questions help to focus your choice as a collector? Yeah, well, you know, like I said, I have a background in animation. And when I look at the NFT space, I, I often look at what is being done here that couldn't have been done prior, whether it was prints or sculpture or whatever, you know, it's like, what, what are you doing with this technology that is a, a step ahead? And to me, animation was never something that could be packaged and sold prior to NFTs. And so when, you know, animation will always appeal to me ahead of anything else, that's my preference. There's a lot of people that feel it, but I think, you know, it's in the same way that like on-chain technology or dynamic NFTs or that kind of stuff will appeal to me more because I go, ooh, this is, this is new, new art. That isn't to say photography or all this stuff is not valid in NFT. I collect all of it, but those have to resonate with me on a more emotional level than just something that I think would look great as an animation or something. So, you know, that, that, that's what that quote is kind of touching on. But yeah, I think what, you know, what, what appeals to me, I think it's, I don't know, I have a pretty wide range. I don't think I, I it's not like I have like one thing that I'm just like need more of this type of thing. But usually it's, you know, it's a mixture of the art being appealing and then the artist being interesting, how they're telling their story, how they're presenting the work. I think marketing is a undervalued aspect of this space. You know, if you look at the best artists, quote unquote, blue chip artists, they're their marketing techniques are incredible because you walk away understanding what the work is about in a way that you wouldn't have gotten from just looking at it. And I think that that, that plays a big role. Good insights. I know I've heard uh, Jake Fried talk about trying to sell some of his uh, pre-NFT animations on USB sticks. And I think it really captures that feeling <laughs> of, you know, it wasn't something that could be sold or owned prior to this technological evolution. And so yeah. it, animation certainly has a, a good home on chain. When you released your meme card at the beginning of this year, you engaged collectors in a unique way. Could you describe this approach and what inspired it? Yeah, yeah. So, the, well, I should clarify, it's the memes labs which I did a meme card in December. And then I did this memes lab card, which was a piece that when I made my meme card, I had two distinctly different ideas of how to approach it. And one was a piece that reflected on 6529's collection and ecosystem, which is the one I went with. And then there was one that was kind of a goofy meme, <laughs> which was GM and GN parody of them. And so I, I, even though I didn't use it, I was like, I, I, I still like this idea. And I think there's something here. So how can I play on this? And what do I do with it? Like, I don't want to sell it. I don't want to, you know, I want to put it out into the world without necessarily making it like 
a piece of art that has to be a big sale or something. So it tied into this other thing I had been working, you know, kind of kicking around, which is this idea of the state. A lot of us in this space are artists slash collectors. And I found that a lot of my vault, quote unquote, my, you know, my cold wallet where I store my art had my own art mixed in with the art I've collected from other artists. And I found that to be a little messy. And so what I did was I made a new wallet, called it the Brinkman Estate. And I, I started putting all of my work that I've like collected back or you know, my artist proofs and all this other stuff into that wallet. And then with this new drop, I, I made it so you could only get it if you traded me back a piece of art from my past in order to get it. And so that created a system where I was I was putting out more supply, but it wasn't it was it was technically a burn because it was a one to one trade. It wasn't like, you know, even though there's a possibility of a hundred more editions, all the editions that I'm getting back are going into this vault. And so I saw it as a way to kind of, you know, some noble card or memes or some of these higher edition drops. I figured some people might take those higher edition ones, trade those back to me for this kind of rarer one. And then I made the the M M&M NFT CCO, which then, you know, Neon Glitch went and made a um, Pepe M M&M and VRM model that you can use in metaverses. And so in the more uh, you know, I'm looking forward to more ways to kind of play with that CCO aspect. But yeah, it's just kind of that's what I love about the spaces. There's no real rules and you can create your own mechanics. And I think as long as you do things in a way that is fair and not extractive. I think most people are down to, you know, have fun with it. It was great to see the way that this lit up some excitement amongst your community of collectors, both on on Twitter as well as in your Discord. People were people were really excited. They had a hard time making choices as to what they would sacrifice. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that was a great conversation that you you initiated. Yeah. And I was surprised that this week I did the, the Dubai drop. And, you know, I, I I gave it to collectors first if they wanted it. And I charged it at a price that was lower than any of my floors. And I really was curious to see if someone would trade me one of those back for the GMGN. And no one has yet. But I think that's like, you know, that's the fun dynamic is that I think only about 35 out of the 100 have been traded. And so that it's an open ended trade opportunity. And so, I you know, in the future, if I do have floors that really drop down, that can always be scooped up and traded for this like, you know, rare piece or something. So I don't know that it, to me, I didn't see it as like something that would be a quick thing, but I saw it as like a long-term like catch all for, you know, anybody that wanted to like swap out NFTs. A, a great idea and, and a good example of innovation that opportunity is boundless within the space for it. So it's so nice to see when it continues to occur. You've talked about pricing additions to make them equivalent to a a one-of-one work. Can you explain that idea and what led you to adopt this approach? That's a good question. (laughs) Well, you know, I I try to do this math in my head sometimes, which is like, you know, if if your one-of-ones are selling for one ETH, then your addition should be, you know, 10 additions at point one ETH. But then I also go through this math of like, then sell the addition at maybe half of that, like 0.05 ETH so that there's room for it to grow. But yeah, I think that, you know, to me, additions are fractionalized one of ones. And it's important to think of them in that way. When you're thinking about pricing and, you know, thinking about what your value is, it's hard to tell your value any day of the week, because, you know, what your stuff sold for a year ago is not what it sold for now, what it sold for six months ago is much lower than what it would sell for now, probably because the market has kind of returned into a degree. And so it's, you know, I usually go and look at a lot of different lower prices and whatever recent sales to kind of get a sense of where my value is at. And then, yeah, using, you know, just dividing based on all that stuff usually helps me kind of figure it out. But yeah, I got that advice early on. That was like, whatever you think it's worth, charge half. And that that has kind of steered me right. That's interesting advice. And I do like the idea of framing this collection as those additions as, as adding up to something similar to a, a one of one. It's sort of a helpful way to view from both the collecting side and I imagine from the creating side. You have a catalog of your digital works on your website, which shows that you've tokenized over 180 individual pieces, totaling up to, I think, almost 5,000 works when additions are factored in. Mm-hmm. How do you maintain a connection with your collectors as your community continues to grow? That's a good question. Well, I mean, I'm always present. I think part of being an artist in the space is just being available 
which is a lot to ask of people, but I personally enjoy it. I enjoy the conversation. You know, my, my discord's passive in that I don't have like, Hey everybody, we got this thing going, you know, I'm like trying to like keep everybody energized, but it's there for when I have announcements and it's there when people have questions, I'm there to answer it. That is the tricky question of like how, you know, do are all collectors equal i think they are but some you know someone that bought a one of one probably feels like they're on a different level than someone that bought a high edition but i have to tr you know in my opinion they're all supportive of me and they're all equal in that sense but you know hmm, I, don't know. I do i do often worry that like someone might not feel like they're getting <laughs> enough attention but maybe that's my own like uh insecurities but yeah i think as long as you give collectors the respect feel like it comes back around and so it's like with the drop i did this week because i kind of charged it a low price i gave all of my collectors first dibs on it and of the 100 editions i think 80 of them went to previous collectors and some of those you know but it was collectors across the board where it's like if a one of one or an edition everybody had the same access and so i think it's just important to make sure that you're always thinking backwards when you're looking ahead yeah, you've def you've definitely managed to preserve and and cultivate an engaged community, and I think a big part of it is that you appear to be regularly accessible. And I, I know folks like that, not in that I don't know overly enthusiastic way, but more so in just uh, responding to questions on Discord or or engaging with other people on on social media, which is is yeah. great to see. That's part of the the beauty of the space when it works well. I think there's something to be said about the value that people get out of collecting art you know a lot of people focus on the floor price and the investment aspect of it but you know a connection to an artist is a value and i i appreciate when i collect art from artists that i can have a conversation with them and i think there's also opportunities that come from being in the space where you know maybe someone will say hey you can have allow list to my project for your community and I can give that to them. And so there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can bring value to people that isn't the direct, you know, price action of the NFT they own. And what I've found is a lot of collectors have reached out and said, Hey, you know, I've gotten, you know, flips from allow lists in the past that were more than any, you know, that made up the difference of anything. And so, you know, it's hard to quantify that kind of stuff, but I think the, the community feels it in the law. Yes, definitely. And that's, that's certainly visible. I have one last question before we wind down. On the Art First show by you and Adam Tastic, each episode mm -hmm. features nine artists who deserve more attention, which really helps to promote awareness of, of different types of art that are out there. Are there any artists who spring to mind that you would like to recommend or audience look into? Anybody who's in the audience right now. <laughs> no, I, I mean... Yeah, there's there's an infinite amount of artists that need more attention. I'm looking at FDOT right now because he has an awesome drop going on with Nifty Gateway this week. I picked up one of his bricks yesterday. And yeah, I think that that's the challenge of the space is there's so much noise that it's really hard to break through and get attention, especially when you put a huge amount of energy into something. It, it can feel like you're I'm, I'm sure, you know, F dot feels like this week, he's probably battling against a bunch of people talking about meme coins, you know, and it's like, <laughs> it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough time for artists, but we have to give them as much attention and love as we can to help kind of break through all the noise. Not to say meme coins aren't valid aspect and an important part of people making money. <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather the DJ go gamble over on that side of the space. But it is it does flood the timeline, especially uh, when people are making money on that stuff. Well, credit to you and Adam Tastic for helping with the discovery process of new artists and artists that have been with us for some time but might not get the attention that they deserve. Brian, you've been very generous with your time today. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we wrap up? Nothing urgent other than shout out to Stuzor and F Dot and Rebecca and everyone in here that is in the show tonight in Miami. I'm looking forward to it and I'm really, you know, happy, like you said, giving, giving some shining a light on others is just as much fun as talking about myself, which I, you know, <laughs> not as comfortable with. And yeah, thanks to everyone that tuned in. Thanks for having me on this. This is great. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'll uh, wrap up by saying that you, you consistently support other people and platforms within this space who are helping to enrich the digital art world and 
at the same time, you're creating your own uniquely meaningful artwork, which we have come to really enjoy and appreciate. Thanks again for, for joining us today to share your story. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And don't forget to join us at our next collector's call.